Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So now I would like to discuss uh, more the implementation side. Um, yeah, as I maybe mentioned some time also ago, I feel that it is important that you also see how to implement the model. I would like to teach you to become really a good programmer to, yeah, try to create an extendable, clean design of our model implementation. Also, since you have a mathematical background, you do know what would be possible extensions of the model. We already discussed some of them. So quantities that are deterministic in say a very basic version of the model could become stochastic later. So it is really a good combination to know the mathematical background, to know the path, you know, the possible paths of extending the model and to have some skills in implementing this, this model. This is also a really a huge asset in the industry. If you do know the mathematical theory, the numerical methods, and if you then are able to implement the model in a clean, extendable design. And that also pays back to, say, the theoretical part. You can then use your implementation to investigate model properties, the behavior of the model, get a deeper understanding of the theory. And since your design is extendable, you, know, you can then grow on this yeah, and explore different aspects. And we will do this in, say, one of the upcoming sessions when we, for example, investigate how does the numerical error depend, for example, on the choice of the equivalent martingale measure. These are all you know, quite, quite nice uh, experiments, which we can do using our our framework. Yeah? So it's not just an implementation of that model, it's maybe a model framework. So we are in the section of interest rate models, discrete forward rate term structure model, and I would like to start discussing the implementation of this. So our model setup, the one that we like to implement is this version. So the version that features here some factor loadings in front of independent Brownian increments. So in contrast to the version that has a volatility parameter in front of correlated Brownian motions, so Brownian motions that have an instantaneous correlations. We know how to translate this version in the other version and back. And uh, we also know how the drift is calculated once we have chosen the numeraire. So let's discuss uh, the implementation. So first part is our model and numerical scheme. So what I like to do is I like to cut the problem now into reasonable pieces. Yeah. So these pieces could be motivated from a mathematical aspect. So it, for example, there's the calculation of the drift and the numeraire. Yeah, These two aspects are related. Why well, it could also be related to a numerical aspect Yeah, that there is a certain thing that provides a numerical message, which for example, I would like to exchange. Yeah? So maybe I like to exchange the model using different model, or I would like to exchange the way how the normal distribution is generated. And a programming aspect that makes this very easy or comfortable is the interface. So I will now cut the problem into parts and define the interface for that part. And then we can later create different implementations. So this decomposition 
uh, that you will see yeah, in, in this lecture. This is just one possible way, and maybe it's not the optimal one. Yeah. Uh, so just see it as an example that we could study. And when, decomp when, when we decompose our problem into different components, we may be guided by some principles. On one side, there is the single responsibility principle. So every module or say class you know, or function should have a responsibility over a single part. So there is a part that generates random numbers. That is a part that creates maybe normal distributed random numbers. There is a part that performs the Euler discretization yeah, and also a part that calculates the drift, part that calculates the numerea. Yeah. So you could decompose these things into different parts. Using interfaces allows you later to exchange the implementation of that part. So there is an encapsulation of this single responsibility. But on the other side, there is another aspect, and that is a little bit pulling in the opposite direction. This is uh, that we would like to have a high cohesion. So this means that aspects that belong together should be close to each other. And a nice example for this second aspect. Yeah? So the second aspect is that you should not cut into too many different things because some things belong together. They should be in one unit. And a nice example for this second aspect are the numerea and the drift. Well, why is this the case? Okay, we have a certain formula that defines the numerea the spot measure numerea, the terminal measure numerea, is defined in terms of our model primitives, our model primitives of the discrete forward rates. And once we have chosen that numerea, there is another formula how we calculate the drift. So this, the function, say, n, which is the numerea at a certain point in time, but this numerea is a function of the forward rates. And since we have spot measure where we accumulate the forward rates, it's actually a function of the forward rates that we have observed before that time. Okay. And then there's the drift, you know, which is associated with this numerea. So it's the drift for the Q and measure. That is also some function of these forward rates. No? And we derive that actually the drift is just a function of L of T, the forward rate that we observe in T. Of course, also a function of other model parameters, no? the sigma, the rho, or the lambdas. And there is a link between these two guys. This link is that the numerator appears there in, in the measure. So to avoid the problem that we create a numerator that is inconsistent to the drift you know, or have a drift implementation that is inconsistent with the numerator, these two parts should be provided by the same component because the component knows the measure. So they should be provided by the same component. And this component is somehow associated with the measure. Okay, so you could think that maybe a good component to cut out of your problem is the measure, and the measure provides these two functions. Actually, I'm not doing this in, in my example, which I show you. In my example, it's just the model that knows these two parts, but that would be a nice extension, you know, a nice improvement of the current design. Okay, so these two things pull a little bit in two opposite directions. And that's also the point that this is just here one possible way uh, in the sense you have to, in, in, in the sense that you have to decide, okay, uh, where do you like to cut? Yeah, and where do you like to have things uh, put together? So what is our task? Our model is our discrete term structure model. And 
we would like to perform an Euler scheme discretization of that. So there's Euler scheme here. Euler scheme for the SDE. So our ETO stochastic process. And when we have the Euler scheme, yeah, we have a sequence of random variables at discrete times. Then we like to do a Monte Carlo simulation. So we like to sample a finite number of sample path. So sample path omega of these random variables. And then later we can use that to value financial product or explore the behavior of these uh, forward rates. So Euler scheme requires a time discretization. So the first step is that I need a time discretization. And maybe that's a first thing that I could define as an interface or could I then reuse different implementations or di reuse an Im implementation of that time discretization? Because actually in this model here, there are already two time discretizations. That here is the time discretization for the Euler scheme, my simulation time. But my forward rates, they also have a time discretization. These indices here, they refer to Li is Li for the period from Ti to Ti plus one. Li is the forward rate L for the period from Ti to Ti plus one, where the capital Ti is my tenor time discretization, my period discretization. Okay, so there is another time discretization here. So this is the tenor time. So when we have the time discretization, I can use the model parameters. Okay, what are my model parameters? My model parameters are the initial value for the forward rate, for the i's forward rate, the factor loadings in front of my Brownian increment. Also, a model parameter is which numerea do we choose? So that's somehow the measure. This then determines the drift. Okay, so since the drift is maybe a derived quantity, yeah, just view maybe one of these as a model parameters. So this is the model parameter that we specify which measure we use, which then implies here the drift. Okay. Then I already discussed that sometimes it's good not to perform the Euler scheme, the Euler discretization for the model primitive variable L, but to perform the discretization on a transformed variable. And since my model now specifies what we discretize and how it is discretized, that is also viewed yeah, in my interpretation as part of the model specification, the model parameter. So another model parameter is our state space transform. That tells me how the forward rate is calculated of the discretized random variables. Okay, if I have that state space transform, for example, if you consider the log normal model, then you know, okay, that will also change a little bit our model parameters. If you consider the log normal model, it's good to discretize the logarithm. That means actually I have a different model parameter for the variable y. Okay, so if 
that is a log normal model, that would be a lambda times Li. If I go to the logarithm, that would be just the lambda without this Li. Likewise, due to Uitzel's lemma, yeah, in the L coordinate, that is a mu times Li for the log normal model. If we go to the logarithm, that is just a mu without the Li and then the minus one half sigma squared. So this state space transform changes how I interpret, how I see, it changes the model parameters that I use in the Euler scheme. So if I view this here as part of the model, then maybe I should specify as model parameters, not the original parameters. I should specify the parameters of the y. So I will specify the initial value of the y. I will specify the factor loadings of the process y. And I will specify the state space transform. Of course, there is a relation to the parameters of the original model. So this is my original SDE. And this is now the STE I am discretizing. So this is my model and I would like to be flexible and exchange different model parameters. For example, I would like to be flexible and use different numerators, which implies then different drifts. I would like to be flexible and maybe investigate different discretization state spaces, yeah? these different transformations there. And of course, the initial value and the factor loading yeah, are also model parameters, which I would like to change from time to time. Going back to the principle with the cohesion, my drift parameter should also be specified in the model. So it's maybe not a model parameter, but it should be part of the model. And now I call this model, this is my process model. If this year is my process. So first my process generates an Euler scheme discretization of the transformed variable y. And then it is just applying my state space transform to create my time discrete process. So the things that I'm writing here in different colors are maybe good interfaces, yeah, good parts yeah, where we could cut our problem into parts that have a single responsibility. So there is the responsibility of providing a time discretization. There is the responsibility of providing the model. And then there is the responsibility of creating out of the time discretization and the model, the Euler scheme. So an implementation would be the Euler scheme. For the Euler scheme, I need the model that specifies the parameters. I need the time discretization. And the third ingredient is I need my Brownian increment. So the Brownian increment is actually the guy that generates the randomness in this game. Yeah? If your initial value is just uh, a deterministic a constant, a yeah? uh, det deterministic random variable, then the problem in motion is generating the randomness, it's generating the risk. And there we have the algorithm that creates the random numbers, the normal distribution, the sampling, the numerical methods of the Monte Carlo simulation. You see that here on the slides, all the objects are random variables. Yeah. I wrote here this equation in terms of random variables. So these guys are random variables, of course, also 
the Brownian increment is a random variable. All the operations which we have here, so there is a multiplication here, and this operator is an operator that operates on random variables. So what would be helpful would be an interface that says, what can I do with a random variable? I can add two random variables. I can multiply a random variable with another random variable. Adding this to this random variable gives me a new random variable. So there should be a random variable. And later we like to calculate things like expectations, variances, covariances. Yeah? So there is a lot of stuff that we could implement in this, uh, in this random app. Before we start looking at these, I would like to make uh, yeah, some remarks on the implementation side. So what I will use very frequently is an interface. So I use an interface for a responsibility of a certain part. For example, the interface of a random variable. What can I do with a random variable? The interface of a Brownian motion. So what is provided by a Brownian motion? Or yeah, a very nice example, also the interface for our model. What has to be provided by the model? Yeah? The numerator, the drift, the initial value, the state space transform the factor loadings. If we implement then later some method, some algorithm that is described in terms of these interfaces. So for example, if it is a method, it has some arguments and the arguments are just specified in terms of an interface. So here as a model, do something with it. Then we may inject later different implementations. So this is related to so-called dependency injection. Yeah, so somehow it depends on how we generate the normal distributed random numbers. The result depends on that. But we can inject different implementations if we just write, for example, here the Euler scheme, just in terms of an interface. Yeah? So if I have an interface that tells me, okay, you can get a normal distributed random variable from me, but I don't tell you how it is generated, then we can inject later different implementations, implementing how we create this delta W. So this is um, a great advantage. It allows us to ex exchange aspects of the implementations, trivial aspects, accuracy. Yeah, do we use single precision floating point numbers, double precision that can be injected or the numerical methods. So a nice example for this is the random variable interface. Does the random variable use single precision floating point number, double precision floating point number to sample the vector? Or also the Brownian motion. So how are random numbers generated? How is the normal distributed random sampling of the Brownian increment created. So first aspect is interfaces. Another aspect is that I like to use or I prefer immutable objects. So an object is immutable if its state does not change after it has been created. Yeah. A counter example is a counter. An object that counts something and you have a method increment, then the object changes its state. You can ask, okay, what is the current value of the counter? And sometimes you observe the object in the state five. And after two additional incrementations, you observe the object in the state seven. So this means the object has a method, get, get value or get counter value. And this method changes its result from time to time, 
even if all the arguments are the same. So in this example, the method does not even have an argument. However, as a mathematician, I think in terms of functions and immutable objects are heavily related to functional programming. So this means I have something like an f of x, and whenever I have the same x, the same input, I get the same result. So if my object represents such a function, so all the methods have these properties that whenever I put the same argument in, I get the same result, then the object is considered to be immutable, so it does not change its state. A parameterized function where the parameter is not part of the argument list uh, would, for example, an object that could have a state where you set or change this parameter via a setter. So speaking in terms of setter and getter, usually an immutable object just has a getter where you can receive values and you get always the same values back from the getter when you provide the same arguments. So requirement, requiring that an object is immutable, so this means the object does not alter its state after creation. This is a big advantage. It will, for example, eliminate, eliminate so-called side effects when you think of concurrent programming, yeah, multiple threads share the same object. You can have strange effects if one part of the program is modifying the object and the other part of the program is observing the object, but doesn't even know that it has been modified by um, another thread. So I prefer immutable objects. That, that means whenever I perform an operation, for example, on a random variable, here in our example, I will create a new object representing the result the two inputs are not changed. So another aspect which will pop up in our little review is that of pre-calculation or caching. So depending on the application, it may be that some objects could be reused. For example, our problem here I have this algorithm to generate an Euler scheme, and now I change a certain model parameter. So it means I change the model. So since I favor immutable objects, it means I create a new model. And then I plug this model into my Euler scheme to generate a new discretization of that changed model. So um, a trivial change is, for example, just change the initial value. But as long as I keep the time discretization here unchanged, I could just reuse the Brownian increments. So I could always use the same Brownian increments, reusing the same random numbers. And so who followed numerical methods know that there are some cases where it is really important to use the same random numbers. For example, if you would like to calculate a derivative, a partial derivative, by using a finite difference. Yeah? So a finite difference is use one initial value, calculate the result, use a slightly shifted initial value, calculate res the result, take the difference yeah, divided by the shift is an approximation of the partial derivative. In that case, it is important to have a high correlation between the two yeah, samplings to use. Yeah, perfect correlation means to use here the same random variables, the same Brownian increments generating this stochastic process. So this is a nice example. I would like to reuse the Brownian increments the Brownian motion. So an example for this situation where I would like to reuse the object are here my Brownian increments. So we could just consider the case we perform simulations with different model parameters. So in that case, it is efficient to recalculate 
or cache the Brownian increments that are reused. So it is efficient that the object providing the guys that have that are to be reused. So in our case, the object providing this is the Brownian motion. So maybe I use a different color. So this guy here is my Brownian motion. And it is the guy that provides the random variables that are the Brownian increments. And I would like to have that the Brownian motion provides these Brownian increments multiple times in different applications again and again. So these are the objects that are to be reused. So since generating the Brownian increment is quite a um, time consuming, quite, quite an um, intensive task, yeah, I need to sample random, I need to generate uniform random numbers. Then if I like to use the ICDF method, I invert the cumulative distribution function of the normal distribution to, to transform uniform to normal. Yeah, This task is time, quite uh, time consuming and for that reason, I would like to store my calculated values in some cache. So this pre-calculation could be done upon construction of the object. So you have a constructor that constructs the objects and my object providing these when I perform the construction of the Brownian motion then I pre-calculate all these objects which are to be reused. So I pre-calculate all these random variables. This means that the construction of the object takes some time. Okay, so this is initialization. Upon initialization of the object implementing the prone in motion, all random variables that are provided, for example, by my method, yeah, give me the Brownian increment for a certain time step, these are pre-calculated. But now it may happen that you are in a certain situation where you need to provide a Brownian motion to a function, but somehow in the function there is a special situation, and in this situation, the method give me the Brownian increment is never called. Okay, so that could happen. Yeah, I we have other examples uh, later. For example, consider you like to value a financial product with your Monte Carlo simulation under terminal measure. And that financial product is just a zero Cooper bond maturing at the terminal time. Okay, so I, I know that this is just one divided by the numerea at the terminal time. And if the terminal time is, uh, and if this model is under terminal measure, then this is just analytic. I do not need a Monte Carlo simulation for that. So there is a special case where I can value the product analytically because I know the numerea is just equal to one. Yeah, just consider this situation, this means that our pre-calculation was performed without any need. So we went through the lengthy step that um, we pre-calculated all the Brown increments upon construction of the object, just to discover that all these guys are not needed. So we initialized the cache, providing these guys, and the cache was is, is not needed. So this situation can be improved by so-called lazy initialization. So lazy initialization is that the required object, so this is our random variable, this is calculated upon request. So when we call the method get Brownian increment, then we perform the calculation of this Brownian increment 
and we store it in the cache and any subsequent call will then provide this cached object. I will use this at some places, yeah? So if you stumble across this, you know, there's maybe a mark that we do lazy initialization. If you have a setup where you have concurrency, you have multiple threads requesting, for example, a Brownian increment from that Brownian motion. So requesting an object from this provider, then of course it's important that you perform this initialization only once. So there has to be some keyword. You have to perform synchronization. So you will see there is the word synchronized around this block that performing the initialization. So when you have two threads that ask for something, okay, one thread is entering, he will populate the cache. The other one is waiting until he has finished. And then the other one is just returning the cached value. So just to avoid that, you perform two initialization concurrently of the same um, object and then create maybe some strange uh, issues with the cache. Um, an object that performs lazy initialization, um, is it actually immutable in the sense that it does not change the state? Well, strictly speaking, this is not true. Yeah, it changes its state in the sense that when it is populating the cache, it is requiring more memory than before. Upon construction, it's very thin. It doesn't require memory. But once you ask for the value that has to be pre-calculated, it is blowing up that cache. And also with respect to timing, the first call to this method, please give me something, requires a lot of time because he's performing the pre-calculation of all these values. But then any subsequent call is very fast yeah, because he's just providing the cached value. So there is a change in state in the sense that we require more memory pre and post initialization, and also the response time of the method changes, pre and post in it. But we still have the property that if we provide the same arguments to the method, we get back the same result. If we have that, then this is called um, effectively um, immutable. So the object does not change state in the in in this sense. Yeah, these are um, a few aspects, yeah? interfaces, lazy initialization, immutable objects, which we will uh, use, which we will stumble upon. And now I would like to do a small code session with you and explore how we cut our problem into some parts to get a flexible framework that allows us to simulate many different interest rate models. Yeah. Our sole limitation is that we have an ethos stochastic process. Actually, the implementation is also a little bit flexible with that. So we could later replace here the Brownian increment with some other, uh, some other increment, some other stochastic driver. And the other limitation is that we have a time discretized interest rate curve. So that we have discrete forward rates. Apart from that, our framework is quite flexible. So let's start with our first ingredient that all the participants here are random variables. I will go through this by doing some experiments. So you can find this experiment here in this class, in this package. Uh, yeah, actually you can find it in this repository, but um, you can also find it in in the experiments repository. And I will just take it from there and we'll go through this. So there's here the projects where we have some 
um, experiments. And here is a pro here is a small Java class that has a main method that performs now some experiments with our interfaces and objects. So my first guy is that I would like to discuss the random variable. So maybe I just comment all these out. And let me discuss the random variable. My random variables in my problem are described by an interface, random variable. So let's have a look at this one. So in my library, there is the interface random variable yeah, hidden here. So you see there's random variable. And what you see is just an interface is description of what we can do with the object. So it's just a lengthy list of methods. Okay, just a lengthy list of methods. So let's have a look at these methods. So you see there are some arithmetic operations. We can add two random variables. We can also add a, a scalar number to a random variable. So the contract is that whenever you call this method to on an object, then he will perform this operation. So this operation is here that he is, applies x plus the argument to this random variable and returns a new object representing the result. So we have some arithmetic operations. We can take the sum, the difference. We can multiply two random variables division. There are also some operations that are nice for our application in mathematical finance. Yeah, for example, there is the cap and the floor. So cut off something on the bottom. So this is just our fun function maximum of x and some given constant. Or there is the function accrue that is replacing the or calculating the random variable x multiplied with one plus a rate l l i times period length. So you just have the argument, the rate, and the period length, and you get um, the accrued uh, uh, random variable. Or discount, yeah, which is divided by one plus rate times period length. Okay, so we can specify that our implementation should provide these um, functions, and then we can define the algorithm in terms of this interface. So our random variable has some arithmetic operations. And also some stuff that is maybe useful in our application. So if you go here and are on our interface random variable, you can open the type hierarchy and you see that uh, there are many different implementations. Yeah? There is a random variable from a double array from a float array, so a single precision and double precision floating point number vector representing this random variable. There's also an interface describing that a random variable can be differentiable, so it can provide the gradient uh, of this, um, uh, of the random variable with respect to input quantities. So this is linked to algorithmic differentiation. So there's a random variable that performs algorithmic differentiation. So you can provide many different 
uh, implementations of this inf interface. A very trivial implementation is just a scalar. So my scalar is just a floating point number. And now I just represent all the operations that we had, for example, add by just adding the two floating point numbers. Yeah, so this plus the argument. Yeah, let's have a look here at the random variable from the floating point double array. So you see this random variable has the internal representation that there is an array of floating point numbers, my realization, representing this random variable. Yeah, and now the implementation is already here a little bit special because sometimes it could be that you need a random variable, but that random variable is actually deterministic. In that case, you could use here our other implementation, the scalar, but this guy can also do it. It has here the value if non-stochastic, so it has um, a field where it stores just the single value instead of storing a vector of one million values that are all uh, identical. So this is just an implementation detail that we like to save a little bit space when the when we already know that the random variable is not a sample vector with different values, but if we know that the random variable is a sample vector where all the values are actually identical. If you then go to some implementation, so for example, we add another random variable to this random variable, then you see, I just check here. Yeah, okay, there's some other stuff going on here, which we can ignore. I just stick, check here, are both guys deterministic? If yes, you can just add the two values and return a new one. But in the general case, we have the loop over all the values of over all the vector, and we create a new result vector from our operation, this random variable plus the argument, okay? So we create here a new um, result vector. So you see that you have here the implementation. So when we have on our previous slide, on our problem, that z is equal to x plus y, Okay, so then this means that we call x and we add y to it, and this will create the new random variable set. And what we do here is just we hide the implementation that we have to loop over all the omegas. So this is the loop over omega. L. If you dig a little bit deeper into this implementation, you see, for example, also that we have here calculate the expectation. So this would be just one divided by n, i from zero to n minus one. This random variable of omega i, but we do it with an error correcting summation, yeah, the so-called Kahn summation. So there is not so trivial stuff also inside here. So this is our vector x of omega i. So let's play a little bit with the random variable. So I have here a small test. Okay, so, um, yeah, I just print here a small headline that this is an experiment with a random variable. So you can create a random variable that just represents a scalar value, say two. You can also create a random variable using now our implementation from double array that represent a vector. So now, now I have the X and the Y so I can calculate x multiplied with y. So I would expect that all the values here are multiplied with two. 
then I can calculate the average of this, the expectation. So if you look here at average, this message just returns a new random variable, but this random variable V will be a deterministic one. So if it is deterministic, you can just ask it for the floating point value. So maybe look at this implementation again of the double value. So you see he's checking, is this random variable deterministic? Yes, then return just the single value. There is a corner case, if it is a vector, but the vector has just one element. Okay, then you can just return this one element. Uh, otherwise I throw an exception. Yeah, then maybe I just print these objects here, yeah? So let's run this uh, little program. So what do I print first? I print first the random variable X. And maybe another remark here, I do a technique which is called implementing against the interface. That means on the left-hand side of my assignments, I always have interfaces. Yeah? On the right-hand side, I say how it is constructed, but then on the left-hand side, I always have the interface X. So this means that the code that comes here below doesn't rely on the specific implementation. This would be different if you would use here this on the left-hand side. Yeah, The code looks the same. It doesn't complain. But now you can do things here below that rely could rely on the specific implementation. So it's a good, good style to have on the left-hand side of the assignment only the interface because that allows you to exchange the right-hand side here and all the code that comes below will still work. At least will still be syntactically correct because the code below does not assume anything um, in addition than X is a random variable. However, if I print the X, he will call the message to string. So this is just the message to string he is calling. Okay, on this random variable. So I can just leave this out. So he's tr transforming the random variable to a string. So, and then he will tell me which specific implementation do we have? So we see the X is this vector here. It is not deterministic. There is this so-called filtration time, which will not be needed here. Yeah? So I specified it as 1.0, but later when we have stochastic processes, okay, there will be some time associated with the random variable. So I can also print the Y, he will print, okay, this is a scalar, it has this value here. We can print the result, Z, which is Y times X, okay, this is just times two. We can print the V, it is the random variable of the same type as the Z, yeah. but now he has calculated the expectation and he has realized that the result is deterministic. So from that V, I can calculate the value. The value is five, yeah? So I get out of it the floating point number. So time discretization. We in have in our problem here two time discretization, simulation time, tenor time. So we specify an interface time discretization that tells me what can I do with the time discretization. And the things that you can do with the time discretization are just, of course, trivial. You have a mapping from an index to a time. You can, for example, also map the index to the time step because we frequently need the delta tj. Yeah, we need it in the Euler scheme. But there's also another guy which we quite often need that was in our drift the M of little t, yeah? recall if you have the tenor discretization. Okay, so there was here the ti, the ti plus one. I have a time that is in between 
to little t. Okay, then we had that i is equal to m of little t. m of little t was the largest index for which t i is less or equal little t. So that could also be a function that should be in my time discretization. Let's have a look at time discretization. So there's a package time here and there is the interface time discretization. So a time discretization should know, of course, the number of times, maybe for convenience, also the number of time steps. Yeah, it's just the number of times minus one, but sometimes your code is much more readable. Yeah, if you have such convenient methods, yeah, so you know, okay, now I'm referring to the number of time steps. I have the map mapping from index to time, from index to time step. And now for convenience, there is here my M of little t, the time index nearest, less or equal for that given time. There are also some other nice methods here, which should be provided by the time discretization, but then it's actually, actually done. My implementation time discretization from array is just a vector of times. Okay, and then I just implement these methods. So for example, the time for a certain index is just look up in the vector. The time step is the difference of the two vectors at i and i plus one. Uh, so, so, so the time step is the difference of the two times looked up in the vector at i and i plus one, and yeah, getting an index for time is just a search for it. So my interface time discretization has the mapping from time index to time. It also has the mapping from time index to time step, delta ti. Uh, there is also an inverse mapping to time index, but this would throw an exception or actually gets me a negative value <clears throat> indicating the insertion point. If I provide a time that is not in my discretization, nice thing is I also have here my function that maps t to m of t to the largest index such that ti is less or equal to this given t. Maybe let's go that here. Maybe the most useful thing of the implementation is that I provide here many different ways in constructing the time discretization. And a very useful one is create me an equidistant time discretization using an initial value, the number of time steps, and the time step size. Yeah? Okay, this is a task which I need to do very often, and I do not want to write this code again and again. So I have in my implementation a nice constructor which creates ti is an initial value plus i times a fixed delta t. Yeah. So there is here a delta t, which I provide, an initial value t0. And then there is the number of time steps n. Okay, so for i from 0 to n, actually I have n plus 1 uh, times and n is the number of time steps which I provide. That's a very useful guy. Let's play a little bit with the time discretization. So let's comment this out here and have a look at my other test, the time discretization. So I can create a time discretization just from a given array. Yeah, so maybe I make it not evenly spaced yeah, here. Let's have a three and um, a five. Okay, so I can just print this time discretization. 
for a given time point, 1.5, I can get the time indexed nearest less or equal. So this is my M of T. I can ask the time step for a given time index. And I have this convenient way of creating, for example, 20 time steps starting in zero with 0.5 time step size. Now let's check what he's printing. Yeah, and maybe you can also play with this a little bit. So my first time discretization, my time discretization one was just here, this array, which I created. Then I provided a time 1.5. Okay, 1.5 is actually here in between. So it's rounded to one. Huh? So one has the time index one. If I ask the time index one again, the time step, yeah, the time step from one to three, that is two. Okay, so you can operate on this time discretization or just here have now this evenly spaced discretization just generated with a very short, short line of code. So the next guy we need is our Browning increment. Okay, that was the one which I marked that. So quite important here in our Euler scheme, I need something that generates Browning increments. So I like to define an interface Brownian motion that generates our delta W. Okay, it should generate this at different times. So I need as an input a time discretization. Okay, and since we like to create a multi-factor interest rate model. So recall in our model, there is a DWK. So I need delta WK, where these guys here are independent Brownian increments. I would like to have an interface that could generate such a vector, delta WK. So it should generate such a vector, delta WK. And all these guys here, they are random variables. So you see that my interface already uses my two other interfaces yeah, where you could use the time discretization and the random variable implementation to generate our implementation of the Brownian motion. So why is this useful? We could use different random number generators, pseudo-random number generation, quasi-random number generation, or different methods in generating the normal distribution, yeah, the inverse of the distribution function, for example. So let's have a look at this. So there is here Monte Carlo Brown in motion. This is our interface. And you see the interface is just give me the Brownian increment, the delta W K for a certain factor, factor of TJ at a certain time. And the result is a random variable. Well, if you have to provide here a time index, then of course the Brownian motion has to be associated with a time discretization. Okay, so I could ask the Brownian motion, what is your time discretization? So I would also like to have this guy. But if I have this guy, then I can already implement, give me the Brownian increment at a certain time, little t for a certain factor, because this is just check the time discretization to get the time index and then ask 
this method here. So in some cases, you can provide default implementations that just rely on the fact that your object is implementing this guy and this guy. So this is our interface of the Brown in Motion. And the Brown in Motion provides me now here with the delta W of Tj, where this is the case factor, the delta Wk of Tj. So this guy is the K, this guy is the J. But I also need to ask him for the underlying time discretization. So this is my interface. This is all I need. An implementation. Let's look here at the type hierarchy. You see there are some implementations here. There is an implementation that allows to generically specify a random number generator. We'll use inversion of the distribution function. Or there is an implementation that readily uses uh, the MSN twister as a random number generator. So for this guy, you need to specify the time discretization, the number of factors, the number of sample paths for the random variable, and the seed for the random number generator. And then there's a subtle thing here. Okay, it, it generates now a sample vector, but which implementation of a random variable should he use? So how can I break up this dependency that this object, so this implementation here, needs to generate a random variable of a certain implementation? So for this, I can use the factory design pattern. I provide another object and this object, actually this here is an interface and this interface just has a method that says, create a random variable when I know the sample vector. So by providing here different these factories, you can create different Brownian motions using different implementations of the random variable, using different implementations of the time discretization. Maybe I look also at the implementation here. So I have the method get Brownian increment. And what you see here is that we do lazy initialization. So there is a cache. You see this thing here has an array of random variables. So this double array is the J for the time and the K for the factor. It stores all these guys, but this cache is not initialized when I initialize the object. When I initialize the object, I just remember what are the parameters, but I do not initialize this error here. Yeah? This cache is not initialized upon construction. Actually, this line here is not necessary, but I just have it as a reminder that this will be done later. Yeah, when is it done? It is done if we ask for the Brownian increment. So if somebody is asking for the Brownian increment, I check, is this cache already populated? If yes, I can just return the corresponding element, the delta W K of tj. But if this cache is not initialized, I pre-calculate the whole Brownian motion. So this is an example of a lazy initialization. And this is thread safe because there's a synchronized here. So this will be done only once. If it is done, this condition here will be flipped to false and the do generate Brownian motion will not be called again, yeah? Because you see, if I enter this function, this function is by the way here below. Yeah? He will allocate um, the 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 memory here, such that this condition is no longer true. Yeah, so he will not enter into this method here twice. 
Yeah, let's have a look how we generate the Brownian increments. So here is this example implementation. So this here is my cache. So this cache in terms of random variable is caching delta w k of tj. So this is the j, this is the k. The k is the number of factors. So from one to n, the number of sample paths is provided. This is my time discretization, which I need. And we just store this and we perform lazy initialization. Yeah, so lazy initialization comes below when we ask for the Brownian increment at a certain time index for a certain factor k. Then we check, do we need to generate the Brownian increments? So first I allocate the array that stores the random normal distributed random sample vectors. So this is now the vector for every j, tj, for every factor, k, and then for every omega. So I have here, say, some, some omega. Number of time steps, number of factors, number of sample paths. Then I just pre-calculate from my time discretization the delta tj and for the Brownian increment, I know the standard deviation is square root of delta tj. So I pre-calculate the square root of delta tj. That is a scaling factor to the standard normal. And then I loop over all omegas, over all time steps, and over all factors. And I create the corresponding random number. And then I have created these sample vectors and I just need to wrap them in random variables. So wrapping them in random variables is, I ask this random variable factory, okay, just wrap this in the corresponding implementation. So we have an example of lazy initialization, nice example here in this implementation. Next thing in my decomposition of the problem is the Euler scheme. So my Euler scheme is the one that now provides the discrete stochastic process that represents the forward rates. Actually, you could place here a tilde because it is not the original realiz the realization of the original SDE. It is a time um, stepping approximation. Yeah, it is an Euler approximation. So this Euler scheme provides these guys, but it needs inputs. And the inputs that are needed are now our Brownian increments that we generated. The time discretization is not needed for the Euler scheme. Why is the time discretization not needed? Because the Brownian motion already knows the time discretization. Yeah? We have provided it to the Brownian motion. So I just like to use the Euler scheme with that time stepping. Yeah? to have consistency. If you would introduce now a second argument, time discretization, that time discretization could be inconsistent to the one that you use here. So I do not provide a separate time discretization, but I will provide our Brownian motion, our Brownian increments. And the second thing that I need to provide is our process model. So this is the initial value, the factor loading and the drift. So my Euler scheme has as input an object implementing a Brownian motion. This includes already the time 
discretization. You know that it has a getter, get time discretization, and our model, so the model that provides the initial value, the drift, the factor loading, the transform that gives me the x. Okay, so this guy here is the x, i of tj. So we have the l is equal to the x. So the blue parts are provided by something which I call process model. So there is something called an implementation Euler scheme from process model. So this process, this Euler scheme interface just then has a value get process value. So this get process value will provide me with the X, okay? The X at a certain time index, the J, for a certain component. So this is a vector X. So this is an XI for a certain component index. And the X is again a random variable. So since we have injected the Brownian motion, which knows how to generate the random variable, we perform all the operations on random variable. We, we get out an implementation of the random variable. So you find this guy in Monte Carlo process. There you find the interface with this get process value. And you also find the implementation of the Euler scheme. Okay, here's the implementation of the Euler scheme. Also uses lazy initialization. And the inputs are the model and the stochastic driver. So the independent increments, this is our Brownian motion. Yeah? If you look here for independent increments, the type hierarchy of this thing, you see that the Brownian motion is just an interface extending this. So I need the model and the power in motion to generate my Euler scheme. Maybe we go don't go into detail with the Euler scheme and just conclude by now playing with all our objects in our little experiment. So what I left out is the experiment with the power in motion. So let's have an experiment with the power in motion. So the random variable and the time discretization is here, done. So for the Brown in motion, I need a time discretization. So I use this convenient method to generate an evenly spaced time discretization. And then I can specify the parameters. So number of factors, this is just a one factor Brown in motion, number of sample paths, the seed of the random number generator. And I use now my Mersenne twister random number generator to generate these Brownian increments. So what we can do is let's recreate the Brownian motion from the increments. So this is, I have W of TI, W of TI for different I's. So I need a vector of random variables. So my X here will be now the W, the X is DW and Initial value of the Brownian motion is zero. So my X of zero is zero. Then I loop over all time steps. I ask the Brownian motion for the Brownian increment. So since we often need the Brownian increment, that's the guy that is provided. And let's just say XI plus one is XI plus the Brownian increment. So that's actually already an Euler scheme. It's a very trivial Euler scheme. It's the Euler scheme with drift is equal to zero and the sigma is equal to one. Now it's the Euler scheme that just generates the Brown motion. Then just maybe plot this. So there's no other output except that I like to plot this and you see I have generated sample paths of the Brown motion. So a section here is a random variable where the same color 
is the same index in, in the vector. So now we have the building blocks together and what is left, so given now that we have the building blocks, what is left is to just specify our stochastic process. So this will be, we specify these parameter here and we will do this then in the next session for our discrete term structure model. So you see, I have here many different specifications from very simple models. You maybe already know here from the equity part, yeah, a stock to more complicated models also here for stocks. And then here's some interest rate models that now provide the calculation of the numerea, the calculation of the drift and we will then have a model within the model that provides here these factor loadings. Yeah, let's do that next time. Thanks, that was it for today.